Hey church, welcome once again to Local. I'm Pastor Abe. I am so excited that you're here and that we're able to dive in to this message together. And again, if you're in the area of San Diego, we want to invite you to come and visit us whenever you're around visiting family or just vacation and come hang out with us. But today, uh, for everybody that we're gathering right here online, whether you're at home, at the office, in your uh, university campus, wherever you may find yourself, I wanna say welcome. I wanna say that today, I'm excited to get to have this dialogue and bring to you this message, part two actually, of a collection that we're calling the House of David. This is the very first collection that we've ever done as a church where we focus um, around a character of scripture. David, in fact, is the person who's mentioned the most after Jesus in all of the Bible. So we thought, hey, why not go and talk about David and learn from the principles, from the from the defeats, from the glory days, from the obscurity, and from everything that that that, that encompasses this man that that has this nickname called the man after God's own heart. He didn't give himself this nickname. This is a nickname given to him by by Scripture, by God. And today I wanna I wanna be able to jump into part two of this. Uh, collection. Uh, but before we do that, I want to thank you again for joining us and always partnering with us, uh, whether you're part of our in-person gathering or of just of our global church. I want to thank you. I want to let you know on behalf of Crystal and I that we love you, that we're grateful for your friendship and that we're praying every single day that God continues to speak to you, to keep you, to guard you. And uh, I want to lift up right now before we get in uh, a prayer. You know, if there's anything in your heart right now, everything that's going on in your life, whether it's financial, whether it's physical, whether whatever need you may you may have in your life right now, I want us to lift it up to Jesus in this moment of prayer. So right there where you are, I'm going to invite you to close your eyes for a second and let me just pray and let just let, let, allow me to lead us in a time of prayer right now. Holy Spirit, we thank you and we acknowledge that your presence is here. We don't have to gather, Lord, in person, Lord, but we are gathered in one spirit. We're gathered in one heart and we declare your words, Lord, that you are Jehovah Jireh, you are the provider. Lord, so I just pray that right now that you would show yourself so faithful in the home of every single person represented on this stream. Whoever's listening right now, that you would cover them, that you would fill them up, that you would be with them and around them wherever they may be. And I just lift up every prayer request, every financial need, every relational need, every financial need, every uh, mental, physical, spiritual need that we may have. Lord, we present them to you. Your word says that you know the desires of our hearts. You know us more than we know ourselves. So we're not here to inform you. We're here to invite you into our situation. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Um, let me tell you a story. Um, I have two daughters, uh, Lux and Tiger. Lux is five, she's about to be six, and Tiger is three, she's about to be four. And I wanna talk to you about Tiger a little bit. Um, a lot of you uh, may know this, but if you don't, I wanna bring you in. Um, Tiger, she is a preemie. She was born a few months premature. She was supposed to be here with us at the end of December. She was actually born at the beginning of October. So it's almost like almost a three month premature the way that she came in. And, and, and let me tell you, as a parent, you know, if you if you've had a, a difficult birth with one of your children, you can relate. But like any parent, you never want any of your children to have to go through seasons of pain and uncertainty, um, let alone you know, understanding that that's never in our plans. No one ever plans for their children to have to struggle, but we know what happens. But when it happens at such a young age, when it happens without it being their responsibility, when it happens without explanation or warning, let me tell you, it's difficult. I'll never forget being in the hospital in the NICU and uh, seeing Crystal, you know, as a, as a mom, you know, the, 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 the heaviness, the burden that she carries. Me as a father, you know, my nature is just to figure it out, just to help, just to do something. But there are certain things that are, that are out of our control. And it was in those moments that my prayer changed from it like just, man, I can't wait for my daughter to be here to, God, may you just be here with my daughter. May you be in control because I am not. It was a season where I didn't understand. I had no clarity and it felt like I had no vision. I couldn't see. It was a season that I want to call today obscurity. Have you ever been in an obscure season? 
where you're looking around, but you can't seem to find or see clearly. You see, whether, whether you find yourself in a season of obscurity right now, let me tell you, just because it looks like there's nobody else in the room, just because you cannot see them, doesn't mean they're not there. Just because you cannot see God doesn't mean he's not there. Can I tell you, God has a purpose for the seasons of obscurity. He uses obscurity. Today, we're talking about this term, ob obscurity. Have you, ever, have you ever dealt with a season of obscurity thinking that no one can see you? We know that you're marked for greatness. We know in this collection, House of David, we're talking about David. We're talking about, yes, he's a king, but you know, he was developed in obscurity. But, but, but what happens when you and I go through obscurity? In the Bible, we see God use obscurity time and time again. Moses, before he was called to be the liberator of his people, um, he was sent to obscurity for 40 years. Jesus himself was in obscurity from age 12 to 30. We don't, we don't know anything about Jesus in those years. It's like, it's like there was no obscurity. And it's because God uses obscurity to prepare our character. You see, this is what you have to understand. The tagline of this collection is, is marked for greatness. And greatness is this spotlight that God puts on you. If, 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 I, can, if I can really explain to you, give you an image of what I, I refer to as greatness, is when, when God finally says, like the moment when, when Jesus stepped out of baptism, the Bible says that the, that the heavens opened up and there was this light and, and the Holy Spirit came and there was an audible voice that says, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. That is greatness. When God shines his light and the world sees not just what you do, but what God does through you. Greatness is the spotlight. But you see, this, 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 this spotlight is, is, is the destination. But many never get to greatness. Many never get to this place where God can shine his light because the process for you to get to that place where God can shine his light is a process called obscurity. And obscurity is, is, is painful. Obscurity is a, a process. Obscurity is challenges. Obscurity is, is God testing your motives. And you see, greatness that you haven't been prepared for, it's like having a baby prematurely. You see, a lot of people quit on themselves because when you step into greatness that you're not ready for, it's, it's, it's actually not a blessing. It could be like a curse. I talked to you about the story of, of little Tyge, right? That she was born a little bit early. And you wanting to step into greatness without you first being processed in obscurity is like a baby that is born prematurely. The earlier the baby comes, the, the higher the chance is that the baby is not gonna make it. Can I tell you, God will never allow you to step into greatness before you're ready because he knows that if you step into a blessing before it's time, that blessing can become a curse. You see, um, God doesn't want you to step into greatness because he doesn't want to expose you. You see, when you step into greatness, greatness doesn't make you into what you are. Greatness simply exposes who you are. Greatness just means that God puts you on a platform. Now, ask yourself this question. Are you ready for greatness? Greatness can look different, but it still means that now the world is going to get to see your process. Can I tell you, you don't want greatness before it's time. You don't want greatness before it's time. You see, you don't want your house before the right time. You don't want to get married before the right time. You don't want a promotion before the right time time. And why? Let me tell you, because you have to understand that if you get it before, you will not have the strength in your spirit to gather and be able to withstand and withhold and carry all the blessings. Blessings can become a burden when you haven't been processed in obscurity. But a blessing before the time comes can be a burden. And you need to understand that God wants to process you in obscurity because if you don't understand, you will think that God is punishing you by keeping you in obscurity when in reality, God is preparing you for greatness in this place called obscurity. You see, because when you don't understand that when you're marked for greatness, that God will place you in obscurity, you think, why is God hiding me? Why is God burying me? Can I tell you, if you feel unseen, unnoticed, you're not buried, you're actually planted.
Before any seed can come in and become the tree and produce fruit and give shade, it must first go underground for a season until its roots get so strong and so deep, it'll be able to carry all the fruit that it's meant to produce. That's why God prepares you in obscurity. Well, you're saying, okay, pastor, I get it. That sounds good, but I don't understand why do I feel like it is God that is hiding me, that I've been playing, I get opportunities, and I feel like God's not giving me the confirmation because God hides everything that he values. Uh, let me give you an example. If you come to my house, I mean, we're, we're in my house right now. You, you'll be able to look around, but the things that you see, as nice as they may look in the outward appearance, this, th these aren't our real valuables. Our real valuables are actually hidden in this house. You know, like when you go to a hotel and there's a little safe and you put it in there, you don't hide things in the safe because you have no worth for them. You hide things in a, in, in, in a, in a, in a, in a shelf because they are the most valuable. Can I tell you, I want to speak to somebody right now that feels unseen, feels like no one remembers you, feels like nobody is calling you. Can I tell you, even when people stop calling, you're still called. Just because you're hidden doesn't mean that you've been disqualified. You're actually being prepared and refined because God has marked you for greatness. So he has to hide you in this season called obscurity to prepare you where no one can see you so you can become a person that nobody can ignore. You see, God doesn't give greatness. He just gives great opportunities. It is what you do with these great opportunities that qualifies you for greatness. And you see, today I want to help you. And we're going to talk about three things uh, that happen in obscurity. But let me give you the title for my message. My title is simply this, The Opportunity in Obscurity. The Opportunity in Obscurity. God wants to give you opportunities that can only be seized in obscurity. God wants to give you opportunities that can only be seized in obscurity. The first opportunity I want to talk to you about is the opportunity of offense. Have you heard about this word offense? Are you offended right now? Someone ever offended you is the worst feeling in the world. Um, I, was, I was looking up this word offense and, and, and I was hearing about um, the criminal version of offense. When you, when you have an offense, that is, the, that is the same as a criminal violation. When there is a law and you violate that law, that is considered an offense. Violating a law is considered an offense. Now, same thing with people. When you're marked for greatness, like David, when you've been marked for greatness, when God has a purpose for your life, when God has a great calling on your life, you put standards in your life. Now, those standards are internal. Uh, we all have internal laws. We all have internal standards. But some people choose not to see the greatness in you and they will val violate your standards. And that is called an offense. Now, people that don't have standards don't understand this. People who don't value themselves can never be violated. They never get offended. And they will get offended at you for being offended. Now, let me, let me, let me, let me explain this because I'm not saying that you should get offended. We're going to dive into it, but, but, but I want you to understand, maybe you're around people that are, that are causing you to lower your standards because they don't have any, they, they get offended that you get offended and they're saying, oh my God, why do you take yourself so seriously? Why do you think that you're such a big deal? Chill out. Has anyone ever told you that? I, I, people have told me all the time, hey, just like relax. Like, like, no, no, but what happens is not that I think I'm a big deal. It's that because I know that I'm called, I can no longer live at a lower level, a lower standard of living. I know that God has called me, so therefore, I'm not going to rush my process, and I'm not going to act a fool just to fit in with the world, because you know that when you're marked, you're not called to fit in. You will never fit in. In fact, you will always be unsettled with average when you know you're called for greatness. So you will rise up and you will, and you will say, no, 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 I, I, I am called to step up and to be different. Now, but just because someone causes an offense doesn't mean that you need to be offended. Let me give you this. Offense is, 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 offense is a moment. Being offended is a decision. 
Let me tell you, people are going to offend you. I know the future. I know you have standards. I know that you have laws, personal. I know you have ways that you want to live. And some people that don't see you the right way, they will violate those laws. Those are called offenses. But you know what? When you're marked for greatness, you're saying, I am not going to stay in offense. I understand that you offend me, but I'm not going to be offended. We let it go. I know. This is so hard for us. Why do I always need to be the bigger person? Because you need to be the bigger person because God has a bigger future for your life. Look at what the Bible says. Let's look at the life of David in Samuel 19, 9 says, but one day when Saul was sitting at home with spear in hand, the tormenting spirit from the Lord suddenly came upon him again. As David played his harp, Saul hurled his spear at David, but David dodged out of the way and leaving the spear stuck in the wall, he fled and escaped into the night. Let me tell you what's going on. David was playing for Saul, the king, the old king. God has removed his hand off of David and now is placing it. There is a transferal of power going on in one room. Can I tell you, some of you right now, not physically, I'm not saying with your family right now, but some of you right now are in a season where God is allowing you to be around people that have crowns but no authority, but God is preparing you. And God, you're saying, God, why do you keep me in this place with bad leadership. Why do you keep me in this place? My boss doesn't get it. My leader doesn't get it. Maybe God is trying to show you what not to do. You don't just get great leadership lessons from great leaders. You get the best leadership lessons from the worst leaders because you learn the lesson of what not to do. And for some of you right now, God has you in that season of obscurity. Why is it obscurity if you're around great leaders? It's because they have the title of leader, but they don't have the light of leadership. So it is still obscurity, not because God wants you to be like them, but God wants you to be like him around them. The greatest lessons are not always learned from the greatest leaders. But David is here around the man that he loves, the king, a man that he honors. And the Bible says it's this man who brought him in, who was grooming him, all of a sudden gets tormented by God. And he says, he gets a spear and he throws it at David, barely missing. David loved Saul. There was a love there for his king. There was a love there for his mentor. There was an, there was an honor and this man chose to attack him. Have you ever been attacked by someone who used to love you? Have you ever been hit by someone that was supposed to protect you? Can I tell you that's heartbreaking? You see, there's this, there's this saying that when you go to battle, you expect to be shot at by the enemy, but no one expects to be hit by friendly fire. See, this is what happened with David. David was there with the king and the king did something that broke his heart. Can I tell you, God will allow this to happen sometimes because what breaks your heart sometimes fixes your focus. You see, the, you see, David's heart needed to be broken. David needed to see that it's not the crown that makes a king, it's the anointing. And he needed to understand, hey, may your love and your commitment and your loyalty not be for a man, but for the God who calls man. You see, when you honor your boss, you don't honor your boss, you honor God in your boss. You honor God in your in-laws. You honor God in those leaders. We don't get to be honorable just because they are, but even when they're not, we're still called to be honorable. Why? Because we don't honor the person, we honor God in the person. But you see, David, David's heart was broken, but his vision was fixed. Fixed on what? Fixed in understanding, hey, I have um, outgrown my stay in this palace. And he understood, hey, I, 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 I need to go. You see, sometimes um, God allows offense to come into your life so that you have, you have to realize, I've overextended my, my stay at this place called average. I've overextended my stay at this place called common. I've overstayed my stay at this place called common.
comfort. Why? Because when we stay in our comfort, we are starving our calling. So sometimes God needs to allow torment to go on somebody else and cause some offense. Not so that you stay offended, but you leave purpose. Can I tell you, it is better to leave with a purpose than to stay without one. Some of you, God has allowed people to offend you so that you have, you can realize, hey, you don't have a purpose here. Why are you still there in this place called average? Why are you still in that job? Why are you still in that relationship? Why are you still in that toxic trait of living? God says, you've already extended your stay. You're called for greatness. Why are you still living in this place called average? And you see, sometimes when you're marked for greatness, you have to understand that some relationships will change. Some people won't be able to handle your promotion. Woo, can I preach on this for a second? Some people are not going to be able to handle the fact that you're losing weight. Some people are not going to be able to handle the fact that you stop smoking. The fact that you're choosing not to cuss. The fact that you choose not to drink. Some people will not be able to handle the fact that you don't want to stay single and you're going to put yourself out there and start going on dates with people that they don't approve. But it doesn't matter because greatness is not meant to be approved by people. It's meant to happen when you're aligned with God. So, so you need to be okay with understanding that when you're marked for greatness, some people are not going to be able to handle your promotions. And they're going to talk about you. They're going to say things, but you know what? You are not what people say about you. You are what God says about you. You, 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 you have to understand this, that you're going to outgrow some people. Oh yeah, you're going to outgrow some people. You're going to grow some people and that's okay. It doesn't mean you stop loving them. It just means that you that they no longer get to set the boundaries for your life. God is calling you to greater. I've had people in my life that couldn't handle uh, uh, what they prayed for. They prayed that I would grow. They just got upset when I outgrew them. They prayed that I would succeed, but they would get upset with me when I was more successful than them. Can I tell you, some people who are with you will eventually be against you. It happened with David. But you know what? It is what David did in this moment that said everything about who he was right? Because he didn't stay to fight back. Sometimes the enemy is going to tell you, hey, he, he, he hit you. You've got to hit him back. But that's not how God works. When you're marked for greatness, you have an opportunity when offense comes to say, hey, I am not going to stay offended. The goal of the enemy is division and his tactic is offense. You know what the enemy wants? He wants a church that is divided, a family that is divided, a marriage that is divided. The enemy is not afraid of how big a thing is. He is afraid of, uh, about how united a thing is. You see, the enemy is not afraid of a big church. He's afraid of a united church. He's not afraid of a marriage that's been together for 10 years. He's afraid of a marriage that comes united under the calling and the mark of greatness over their life. But Jesus and says, hey, greater is he who is within us than he who is trying to divide us. You see, the tactic is always offense because the goal is always division. You see, he, 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 the, the, the enemy can't hurt you. So you know what he does? He reminds you of your hurt. The enemy cannot touch you. You see, because something happens when you give your life to Jesus. The enemy cannot take your life, so he tries to take your destiny by bringing division. And how does he bring division? By offense. He cannot touch you. You're too favored. You're too covered. You're too blessed. You got too much grace. You got too much peace. But you know what he can do? He can remind you of that time that that person hurt you and try to get you to camp in this place called offense. This is what David was facing. He had an opportunity from Satan. And you have an opportunity from God. Are you going to stay and play in this palace offended? Or are you going to answer my call and go, can I tell you, it's not time to stay. It's time to go. Offended is a, 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 a decision that we are not going to make. When God puts us in obscurity, we know I want to see the full vision. I'm not going to stay behind this fence called offense. I want to catch a glimpse of what God has for me. So I'm going to get over myself. I want to get the full vision. Vision. Come on, it's time to move and not stay in this place called 
offense. The second opportunity that I want you to know that, that God gives you, that the enemy tries to use in the, same, in, in the season of obscurity is the opportunity to do what you want. This, this opportunity is, is, is very tempting for you to do your will, to do what you want. Have you ever been in that place? I'm just going to do what I want. There are two wills. Uh, a lot of Christian thinks, man, I'm doing, I'm doing God's will or I'm doing Satan's will. And you're like, as long as I'm not doing Satan's will, then I'm okay. As long as I'm not wearing all black and I'm not like doing horns and going to the crazy concerts and practice Satanism, I'm not doing Satan's will. But can I tell you, Satan doesn't want you to do his will. Satan wants you to do your will. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like there is God's will. Satan doesn't even have a will. He has no power. He has no authority. He's un when, when you when you look Satan in the face, that means you're looking down. But but you see, this is this is what Satan does. He knows he cannot get you to do his will, so he tries to get you to do your will. And when you do your will, when you do your vision, you're in division with God. You're divided. What, what, what do you mean I'm divided? Division just means. Die vision, two visions. It doesn't mean that you're against God. It doesn't mean that you don't that you hate God's vision. It just means that you don't think it's more valuable than yours. Look at what happened in the life of David in 1 Samuel chapter 24, verses 1 through 4. It says, After Saul returned from fighting the Philistines, he was told that David had gone into the wilderness of Enjadai. So Saul chose 3,000 elite troops from all Israel and went to search for David and his men near the rocks of the wild goats at the place where the road passes from some sheep holes. Saul went into a cave to relieve himself. This is where his story comes. But as it happened, David and his men were hiding further back in that very cave. Now it's your opportunity, David's men whispered to him. Today the Lord is telling you, I will certainly put your enemy into your power to do with you as you wish. These men whispered, this is what the Lord says. Be careful who you listen to in the cave. Be careful of how sure people are when they say, this is what God said. How are you so sure that you can listen to God and still just be a servant? Why do you keep taking relationship advice from single people? Why do you keep taking financial advice from broke people? These men said, this is what God means. Be careful. Can I tell you? Let me encourage you with this. God, if he wants to speak to you, he will speak to you. Yes, he will use others, but God will never go against his own word. So be careful when a man tells you, God told me to tell you to go dishonor. God is not a God of dishonor. He's a God of, he honors distance, but not dishonor. Doesn't mean you have to be up close with your abusers. You got to create distance. You got to create margin. You got to stay safe spiritually, physically, mentally. But that does, that does not give us the right to get our own justice. The Bible says justice is the Lord's. Let me tell you, David went into a cave. The Bible says is that they had gone from victory to victory and they were going to a cave. This is what happens when we go from victory to victory. Sometimes we just need a place to rest. And it is, it is, it is when we're exhausted. It is when we've been out there just killing it. Man, you've been making good money. Hey, man, everything's good at home. Hey, you're, you've been going to church for two weeks in a row. Hey, man, you're feeling good. You know what you do? You put your guard down in this cave called obscurity. Sometimes what happens in this cave called obscurity is that we allow what was meant to be a season, a season of, of, of rest to become a season of resistance. We resist getting back out there. We're like, nah, man, I, I, I can live off my old glories. I can live off my old accolades. I can, people should respect me for what I've done in the past. And God is saying, I allowed you to be in this moment to rest, not to resist your calling. You see, the Bible says that he went into a cave because, because Saul was trying to kill him. Is anybody trying to kill you right now? Let's be honest. I'm not talking about physically kill you. I'm not trying to end your life. I'm talking about killing 
your faith, killing your hope over a situation that you've been praying for for years and someone's telling you, hey man, like, it's all good. Maybe it wasn't in the cards for you. Maybe someone's trying to kill your character right now. A friend of a friend that, 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 um, that is talking about you behind your back. Have you ever met those character assassins? You, you meet them and when you ask about someone else, hey man, can, can you tell me, about, t t tell me about Lauren? Oh yeah, Lauren, I know her. But if I was you, I'd be careful because I don't know for sure, but this is what I've heard. Hey, 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 you know what? Let me be the own judge of that. You see, there's a lot of people that are out there trying to kill something in you because your greatness threatens their average life. You see, there is nothing like living great that will cause average people to go after you because it exposes who they are. The Bible says that the David's men started to whisper to him. Why were they whispering? It's because they were close to him. You can only whisper when you're up close. Can I tell you, be careful who you allow close. I'm not telling you not to have friends who don't love Jesus. I'm not asking you not to be friends with your coworkers, not to have a relationship with your neighbors. I'm not telling you that because God's calling you to those places. I'm just saying, be careful who you allow into that inner circle that speaks into your heart, that speaks into your soul. Why? Because when they whisper to you, that begins to go into your heart and out of the heart, the mouth speaks. Out of, you see, you're, you gotta guard your heart because everything flows from it. So be careful who you allow into your heart. Be careful who you speak to in that cave called obscurity. Why? Because your conversations in the cave will determine how long you stay in the cave. Are you having conversations to plan the future or just to talk about the pain of the past? Are you having conversations with people that are ahead of you or people that are just telling you they're tired like you? Are you having conversations with people that fuel your faith or that fuel your fear? Be careful with the conversations in the cave because they will determine how long you stay in the cave and who you are when you get out of the cave. Let me tell you, if you're in a cave of obscurity, it is an opportunity to come out and be a different person. Can I tell you the cave of obscurity is this place that God wants to use to prepare you, to mold you where no one can see you so that when you get back out there, you are the person that you're called to be. Sometimes God calls you into isolation because he wants you to go through preparation before you step back out there. Do not waste a cave season in your comfort. Use your cave season to work towards your calling. How do you waste a cave season? by coming out being the same person that you were. If you feel like you're in a cave of obscurity and you wanna do what you want, no, in the cave is where you say, I surrender my will. I surrender who I am. I surrender my desire. I surrender my agenda. Lord, let it not be my will, but let it be yours. And I can guarantee you, when you come out of that cave, you'll be a brand new person. David is chosen for greatness and still ends up in a cave. Just because you're in a cave doesn't mean that you're not called. Just because you're hidden doesn't mean you're not honored. God sees you even in your cave. You see in this cave, it is a place of transformation. Can I tell you the pain that you're going through right, right now is not meant to end you, but to end some things off your life, to shake some things off your life. I pray that in this season of obscurity that you will take the opportunity to shed the old you and to become the person God wants you to be. The last opportunity I want, I want to talk to you about is the, the opportunity of temptation. This is a real one. David was was tempted. Have you ever, have you ever won a game and uh, start getting cocky? Uh, let, let me tell you, I, I, I love board games. I'm not great at them. But in, in, in our house, you know, Crystal knows, we play Monopoly and I can get really into it. Like I start, you know, I call it Godfather rules. Like I just start doing things that are not in the game. And I feel like a lot of people do that, you know? People call it cheating. I call it being a strategist. I call it being great at board games. And uh, you know, I get really intense. 
And I make sure that when I win, maybe I'm a, I'm a, bad, I'm a bad loser, but I'm also a bad winner. Have you ever met a bad winner? It, lets it, it gets to your head. Oh my God, I, hey, respect. Respect the Monopoly King. Respect the Monop. My five-year-old is like crying and I'm like, grow up. I'm like, you know. And what happens is that when it gets to your head, you put your guard down, you relax. Have you ever just gotten caught off guard because you put your guard down? You're having a great week at work and you know, you're, you're winning and all of a sudden you're out with your buddies and you're at a, at a physical high, but you're at a moral low. You see, your, your, your charisma is at a high, but your character is at a low because you feel entitled. You feel like you deserve the, the, the extra look. You deserve to have a night off of being the good person. You deserve that time. And the devil will use this time that you put your guard down to attack you. You see, greatness is, is not so much about how good you are, but how consistent you are. The enemy knows and he waits for your weakest moment, for that moment of, of obscurity when you feel like nobody is watching because the devil cannot work in the light. So he works when we're exhausted, when we go into the shadows of obscurity. You see, the, the enemy wants you to, to be tired uh, so that you can focus on things that don't matter and that you can be distracted about the things that do. He wants you to be so focused on things that don't matter. And when you get home with your kids, you're too distracted with work that you think you're doing for them and you don't have time for them. He, he'll get you distracted with building a great house that you forget to build a home. He will, he'll get you distracted to make all this money instead of the reason why you're making the money was to enjoy it with the real blessings that are your children. And the way he does that is the, the reason why he does that is that because he comes in in the moments of obscurity um, to tempt you. Can, can I tell you this? Tempt, being tempted is not a sin. Being tempted is absolutely not a sin, but it absolutely always leads to sin. You see, being, being tempted is, is human. Being tempted is understanding that we're tired, that we're low, and the enemy is trying to give us an opportunity to fail. But every time you're tempted, it is an opportunity to fail or an opportunity to snap back into it and say, nope, I rebuke you, Satan. This is what God wants to use as a wake-up call. It's like this annoying alarm and you're tempted to snooze or to get up and be a brand new person. Can I tell you, do not condemn yourself for being tempted. Celebrate the fact that you were tempted, but you didn't fall into temptation. Trap. Temptation is just a trap. Temptation is just like every time you hear temptation, you're like, that's a trap. That's a trap. I'm not, I'm not, I haven't fallen into sin yet, but I very easily could. In 2 Samuel 11, um, the Bible says that late one afternoon after his midday rest, David got out of bed and was walking on the roof of the palace as he looked over the city and he noticed a woman of unusual beauty taking a bath. He sent out uh, to find her and, 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 and she was told that her name is Bathsheba, the daughter of Iliam and the wife of Uriah, the Hittite. You see, and then David sent a messenger to get her. And when she came to the palace, he slept with her. And then she returned home. Later, when Bathsheba discovered that she was pregnant, she sent David a message. Hey, I am pregnant. Can I tell you? Um, David was a king. And at this moment, the whole army had gone into battle. But he decided to stay home to, to be comfortable. And it was in that time of comfort that temptation came and, and got the best of David. You see, temptation will get the best out of the best of us. Temptation will come when people who are even marked for greatness are in a place where they're not supposed to be. You see, sometimes even the best of us can lead ourselves into places that feel good, but actually carry so much death. Can I tell you this about temptation? We're all tempted differently. Satan will only tempt you with what tempts you. Not with what tempts your friends. Can I tell you, your friends are not tempted by the things that tempt you. Let us be careful that we don't judge people based on their temptation because we all have something that tempts us. 
We all have something that you'll cause your eye to get distracted from the path that God has for you. David was supposed to be in battle, but he stayed in bed and his eye was caught, but something that caught his attention. And you see, this is what Satan does. All he has to do is bring you to a place that just feels good. Open up doors for you. Can I tell you? Not every door that opens for you was opened by God. Be careful that you walk through doors that Satan has opened when it feels like it's too easy, when it feels like it's self-serving, when it feels like it's pleasurable. This is how you know it's Satan. It's pleasure first and torment later. But with God, it's always process first and pleasure later. You see, when the first step is pleasure, you know it's not God because Satan will give you pleasure up front and will make you pay on the back end. But God sometimes will make you pay up front but you know the pleasure is after and forever let us not just jump into things because they're pleasurable step into things that sometimes challenge you grow you and know that behind that obedience it is a favor of God it is a blessing of God you see this is what I want you to do understand that temptation is a trap it is an opportunity I was, I was reading this thing about temptation and it says that temptation is this chemical uh, reaction that happens in our brain when we are tempted. Temptation uh, it causes these chemicals to move around and then I saw this, this, this fact about, about temptation. That this chemical reaction we call temptation only lasts seven minutes. I, I, I want you to listen to what I just said. Your brain, when it's tempted by Food that you know you're not supposed to be eating when you're on a diet, okay? By people you know you're not supposed to be looking at. By things you're not supposed to be searching. By activities you're not supposed to be participating. But your brain is tempted because you know there's immediate pleasure. You see that, that feeling called temptation chemically can only last seven minutes. Hey, can I tell you? Just hold on. Resist temptation. Hey, can you handle seven minutes? It's the number of completion. Why? Because you need to hold on to something that is complete, something that is whole. You see, the only way we can resist temptation is to just walk away and say, you know what? I, I don't want the pleasure. I want, I, I want my purpose. I, I, want, I want to stay on my path. I don't want to go into pleasure for a moment. Because you see, with Bathsheba, he walked away and Bathsheba came back and said, hey, um, I'm pregnant now. Isn't it crazy? It marked David forever it was a momentary relationship that had um, ramifications that lasted a lifetime even today we're still talking about it can i tell you let it be known that when you're marked for greatness god places you in obscurity and he will allow temptation to come not so that you could fall into it you're not a sinner because you're tempted you're you're, you're a conqueror you are marked for greatness. You're called to be a leader. You're called to be able to look at these temptations in the eye and say, no, 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 no. I know this feels good right now, but what God has for me is not just to make me feel good, but it is to be good for me and my loved ones and my children and my children's children. Let us not settle for momentary pleasure, but for eternal legacy. Let us not just live a life and fall into the things that look great right now, but rob us from what really is great. Let us not just go after what's available right now but what's aligned for in eternity let me tell you you're marked for greatness and if we can learn from David is that there's always opportunities in obscurity so are you in obscurity right now do, do you feel like you're in a place where no one can see you can I tell you you're there by design by God's design allow yourself to be processed and prune and when you come out of this cave called obscurity you will say hey i am a better person because of it i want to pray for you right now right there where you're where you're at i want you to just close your eyes for a second and, and just listen to my words i want to pray that in this season of obscurity you would be reminded that you're there by design that there are opportunities in obscurity that obscurity is there to refine you not to define you 
You have not been forgotten. You're not being unseen. You're not overlooked. You are hidden because God hides his valuables. But when your time comes, he will bring you out and show you off to the world. I love you, Jesus. And I thank you for this message in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Church, I want to tell you, hang in there. You are marked for greatness. And if you're in a season of obscurity, just know this too shall pass. There's a great calling on your life. I pray that you have an amazing week. And uh, I hope that I can see you very, very soon. We love you so much. Thank you for always partnering with us in faith and financially. And uh, we're excited. In, in a few weeks, we're going to have some very, very cool news for y'all. Some great excitements and updates about what God is doing through us, through you, through your generosity. And I cannot wait to share. So stay tuned. We will see you soon. Church, I love you so much. I'll see you soon.